Though I did do a little study a couple of years ago, um, on uh, I correlated uh, final grades for one of my courses, undergraduate course, with plagiarism percentages according to Turnitin, which obviously is not 100% accurate, but it's a measurement of some sort, with attendance rates, because in that course I take every hour I checked if people were there. And uh, surprisingly enough, we did find a very clear correlation between sort of final grade and the people who were coming and the levels of copying or whatever it was they were doing uh, and so on. So attendance is not an only marker, but it's one marker of, uh, of performance and, and things like that. And if you're not here, you can't perform. But uh, um, anyway, um, right, today we're going to look in a little bit more detail at uh, Western Europe t excluding the British Isles uh, during the 5th and 6th centuries primarily, during which time we see the Ostrogothic peoples dominating a large part of what is now Italy, okay, and into what is in fact sort of Provence uh, in southeastern France. Uh, we see a number of people coming into what is now Spain and Portugal, but most, in the long term, most significantly, the Visigoths arrive. Uh, we see lots of people making their way into what is now France, but ultimately it is the Franks who take over there. And at a later stage, we see these Longobards, the Lombards, coming in and exploiting the kind of decline of the Ostrogothic kingdom, partly under the influence of uh, what the Byzantines are doing, and establishing themselves in there. Um, our presenter for today is uh, Theodoric, I mean Ravel, uh, who will come up in a minute and tell us all about the Ostrogoths, because kind of chronologically they're perhaps uh, the most important. But I thought we'd just kind of mention, highlight at the start, a few kind of themes which I'm hoping will come up more than once and that I want us to look at in the discussions that we will have. And with reference to that, I hope, therefore, that you have all either printed or, to save the Amazon rainforests, read online or with your mobile device or something like that, whatever you all do these days, uh, the two texts which I connected via Moodle, uh, the letters sent by, or rather on behalf of King Theodoric uh, to various individuals. They tell us a little bit about his administration as a uh, king in Italy. And then the uh, various uh, uh, references and discussions of the Frankish king Clovis by Gregory of Tours, which gives, in my view, a very interesting picture of both Clovis and a little bit about what Gregory is doing. And um, so if you haven't... Uh, looked at those. We will be discussing those, I think, for a large part of the second hour, so you better uh, have a quick read of your friend's copy or something during the break uh, if you have time. So a number of themes then that I think we might pick up on and so on, some things that we discussed more generally on uh, Tuesday in class. Um, Romanitas, Romanness. How do these individuals, um, Theodoric, Clovis, or Gregory, and Cassiodorus, the uh, secretary of uh, Theodoric, how do they kind of present Romanness, and how do these people perceive themselves in connection to uh, Rome? And again, it's one of these things I've been banging on about uh, more than once, that we don't want to see a kind of sudden break somewhere in the 5th century. We say, okay, end of Rome, that's the end of everything Roman. Now we're all kind of medieval and wearing kind of simple clothes and talking bad Latin and whatever it is. Okay, uh, there was a transitional period, and can we even talk about a kind of change? And certainly, how did the people see it at the time? Okay, they may be right or wrong, but it's important to see, uh, understand how they perceived things there. Part of that, in a way, because we shouldn't exclude Christianity from Romanitas, because by the end of the Roman Empire, it was an integral part of it, and we'll discuss that in a bit more detail in a few weeks. But what's the importance, what's the role, religious, but also political and cultural role, of Christianity? in all of this. Okay, where do they, where do they fit in, uh, in a sense? And lastly, 
we've called this co topic Rome's heirs, the barbarian kingdoms. We talked a lot about the barbarian side of the equation uh, on Tuesday, what that means and so on, or doesn't mean, or whatever. For uh, the people in charge, the small minority, the guy at the top and his kind of band of followers who keep things going uh, and so on, okay, the kings and their entourage, what's going on? Okay, we don't have an emperor anymore, uh, in a sense, though, as we said, there may be some aspirations in one way or another. Um, and in the Latin texts, we get the word rex being used. These people are called king. Now, the question is, do we see, oh, well, they're just Germanic kind of uh, people and they're Germanic kings or whatever, but this is a Latin word being applied to people who are now living in what had been the Roman Empire, still might be in a sense. Uh, so we can't say that they're necessarily coming in and bringing in their Germanic style of rule. Something new is happening here. It's not an emperor, it's not a Roman emperor, but it's not just some kind of Germanic warlord. It's something that perhaps mixes the two together. As I mentioned the other day, for example, many of these kings issued laws, codes connected to their names. Okay? They're trying to rule more in a Roman way, in accordance with Roman rule and so on. Uh, the laws themselves might be old Germanic customs, but they're writing them down and they're communicating them to their people, like a Roman emperor might have done. So again, what kind of people were they in charge? What's going on here? And I think everything is kind of mixed up, okay? We can't necessarily uh, push it one way or the other. And probably when we get to our discussion, we will see in theory, at least, a contrast, perhaps, between what appears to be a very sophisticated, very Romanized Theodoric in his letters and so on, and they're quoting uh, old classical literature and all sorts of things like that, uh, in contrast to the picture we get of Clovis. And although he's a kind of hero figure for Gregory of Tours, we get a, I, I at least get a rather different impression. Now, maybe it's the sources that give this impression. The two men may have been very similar, whatever, we'll have to discuss that and so on. So in terms of Romanus, in terms of the role of, of Christianity and so on, and therefore also the, their identity as kings, very important. And I mentioned again on Tuesday, we should stress it again with reference to Christianity, uh, very important. Um, at the time, and kind of subsequently especially, the most dominant form of Christianity in Western Europe was Catholicism, okay? But during this period, during this very late Roman uh, or sub-Roman and early post-Roman period, we see a lot of people, including quite a lot of these Germanic uh, uh, kings and their followers, uh, following this Arianism. Uh, which becomes a heresy, okay, or because uh, it's not the dominant form, so the people in charge call it a heresy, where they in interpret the Trinity in a slightly different way. Uh, and we're going to come back to the issue of, uh, of the role of these two forms and what's going on and how much this is perhaps a, a, a political issues and so on going on, particularly with reference to Gregory of Tours, because Gregory of Tours really hated Arianism and Arius. He loves to tell the story about how the heretic Arius died while sitting on the toilet. He really thinks that was a, a good way for this bad man to end and so on. So how he presents Christianity, okay, as a, not just as a member of the clergy himself, but with a certain axe to grind here, I think is important. So we'll come back to those issues later. Okay, any questions now? Okay, Fatih. Uh, Synthesis uh, with being being uh, Roman and German, or uh, are we talking about a complete being German or trying to be German? You mean in, in Western in Europe? Customs and uh, cultural habits. Well, I think, yeah, synthesis might be a good concept for us to think about. I'm not saying I would agree 100% because I think we need to discuss this or whatever, but a synthesis might be something that's going on. We don't have. Uh, the Rome of Julius Caesar anymore, but then we didn't have the Rome of Julius Caesar for a good few hundred years. But these people, Clovis and his followers, uh, and their successors especially, uh, are not really comparable to their own Germanic ancestors a couple of hundred years earlier either. Something else is going on. Now, people and things are constantly evolving, so we're not expecting things to stay the same anyway. But this is a new situation which is both 
developing from Rome and is bringing some Germanic things in. The law codes is a very good example of that. They issue a law, they print a law, they give a law in the way that a Roman emperor would have done. But a lot of the laws they're giving are Germanic customs about, okay, if you kill someone, then we punish you this way or that way, and depending on your rank and so on. It's the same in Anglo-Saxon England as well. We'll talk about Anglo-Saxon laws uh, later. So. Um, Actually, that, I'm getting, getting colours on my face or something if I go there. Uh, so that's one example where uh, Germanic law codes are taking a, what we might call, Roman form, a Roman idea, but then putting it into a, a kind of more Germanic context. But then everything in it isn't necessarily Germanic either in a traditional way, so it's very hard to know how far we can, we can go back and things like that. And we'll see when we look at Christianity and the conversion of con of Constantine, of Clovis and so on, okay, uh, it's perhaps a little bit more complicated than we see uh, Gregory of Tours showing, and there's a lot more going on there, a little bit more synthesis perhaps uh, going on there as well. Any other questions? Any other points? Okay, Ravel, come and tell us about Theodoric and those Ostro boys. Okay, let's spend a few minutes just summarizing um, the early history of the uh, Merovingian Franks. Um, Frank being a, a bigger um, uh, term for West Germanic uh, tribes that ended, uh, entered uh, up in northeastern uh, Roman Empire, originally around kind of the, what's now Belgium and then spreading further south to various areas. And one particular family uh, ends up becoming uh, the dominant one and taking over. And it's their perhaps most famous king, uh, Clovis, that we shall talk about uh, in more detail later, uh, who largely kind of set them up uh, and so on. Um, what is the other big dynasty of Franks about whom we shall have some discussion in a number of weeks' time, maybe after the Byram? Carolingians, okay, they're the successors of the Merovingians and called Carolingians in their case because lots of them were called Charles, Carolus in uh, Latin form, whatever, okay, including obviously Carolus Magnus, Charles the Great, Charlemagne, uh, as perhaps their most famous. Merovingians taking their name from a kind of mythical ancestor, Merovec, and lots of the Germanic dynasties trace their genealogies, their ancestors, to these kind of semi-godlike uh, uh, figures and things like that. And he's the their kind of ancestor figure uh, for them, and they end up becoming known as Merovingians. And they dominate uh, what is now France and other parts of Europe in various ways from the end of the fifth century, when Clovis was active, down into the eighth century when the Carolingians kind of take over, though the uh, Merovingians were pretty much in decline at that point. Um, while we're on names, Clovis, which as I said is um, the most, perhaps most famous and most important uh, retrospectively of their rulers, uh, his name becomes what? Do we know? Everyone sharing gum down there? Right, I can't do that, obviously I'm talking. Uh, Clovis gets changed gradually and ends up becoming what? Clive. No. Nice guess. I don't, I don't even know where the name Clive comes from. No, that's Charles. Okay, the original name, in fact, was probably something like that, Clodovicus or something like that, okay. It's a Latinized Germanic name, but let's just do this. Louis. Louis, okay. How many kings of France have been called Louis over the many years and so on, and they're all really just Clovises, okay. Uh, harking back to this very, very early uh, king of, uh, of the Franks, so very important in that sense there. For the period we're looking at, it's Gregory of Tours, 
um, Gregory Bishop of Tours and his 10 books of histories that I mentioned on Tuesday. That is our main source, particularly for uh, Clovis, but also uh, for the period uh, after him, 100 years or so after him. And it's, it's his, some of his uh, uh, paragraphs about uh, Clovis that we shall be discussing later. But let's look at the background a little bit more. Start as a background of what's going on. And we've got this uh, map here, which shows primarily the spread of the Franks during the uh, late 5th and early 6th centuries uh, under Clovis's um, uh, control and so on. So we begin up here. Okay? The Franks are one small group of, of um, Germanic peoples who've kind of crept across uh, uh, the badly defended borders of the Roman Empire and are in kind of northeastern France and, and Belgium, somewhere around about there, okay, up up here somewhere that they begin uh, their life. Uh, they kind of his appear historically under a king called Childeric, uh, who was uh, during, probably during the 460s, was some kind of a war leader for these, uh, these people. And uh, we do actually have uh, uh, his, uh, supposedly his grave uh, survives and we can see uh, that he was quite a wealthy kind of uh, socio-economically as well as militarily important person up there working with the local authorities but also trying to do his own thing probably is what was, uh, what was the case. Somewhere round about 481 he was succeeded by his son. Clovis, okay. So um, he dies round about 480, 81, something like that. We're not sure exactly. Gregory Tours doesn't always give exact dates and so on, but it's round about that period that he dies, and then Clovis takes over, and he is really the one who uh, establishes the dynasty and establishes Frankish power, and as you can see from these big thick arrows, arrows pretty much takes over uh, the whole of uh, what is Gaul, what was considered to be Gaul during that time from various uh, primarily other Germanic peoples. Um, now, we can go through lots and lots of dates, and so we don't need to worry too much about these things. And the dates, we've got some dates on here, so let's not get too hung up on these. But during the, starting in the 480s, but especially 490s and the early 500s is when he makes some of his biggest uh, conquests of various sorts. Okay? He begins, obviously, naturally with his immediate neighbours, uh, other Germanic peoples, the Thuringians uh, up here, and the Alamans over there, we have some uh, references to these, uh, uh, these battles uh, and these victories going on. Uh, and exactly his motivation uh, is quite important and so on. Uh, four, nine, six, or seven, it could be seven, uh, what's the importance of that one? What is important about that battle? His victory over the Alamans, the Alemanni, what is the importance of of that victory. It's, it figures in uh, our reading material. It's part of the reading material there. It's important because it's important. Sorry? Yeah, it's the point that um, marks or inspires his eventual or alleged conversion to Christianity. So um, according to the no, no, yeah. According to the narrative that we can traditionally understand from Gregory of Tours, 496, 97, uh, victory over the Alemanni, and that's when he decides in one way or another to come, become a Christian. Okay, Fatih, you wanted to add? No? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, anything you want to say? We're going to come back to this in more detail later on. Um, his, in, his conversion as described in Gregory of Tours and as usually kind of uh, thought about uh, is making a very clear parallel with what? He, he's doing badly in a battle, he calls upon the Christian God or, or Jesus Christ, he wins the battle, okay. Who else won a battle because he said, okay, let's give the Christian God and Jesus Christ a chance? Who else? 
Constantine, okay, his conversion is connected to uh, uh, a rather pagan interpretation, which is, if this god helps me win the battle, then this god must be good, or whatever, and things like that. We'll come back to that issue in a minute. Yep. Well, yeah, because, pos- uh, of course, uh, first because of uh, his wife's brainwashing, but after, after that, uh, because of the vision. His wife's persistence, perhaps, or something. Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. So there are strong parallels uh, which either were historically accurate or obviously Gregory of Tours is trying to present that, and we'll look at the details uh, of this afterwards because it, uh, it's an important way of us understanding our sources and what's going on in them and so on. Um, Somewhere around about 500, uh, 501, he then begins the move further uh, south. Now this area again had been controlled for a little while by these Burgundians who were connected uh, to the Ostrogoths as well as we heard before, uh, where they were also a, uh, a Germanic people. That obviously the French uh, regional name Burgundy is, uh, uh, comes from that. I think it's even connected ultimately to things like Bavaria and things. I'm not sure the, the details of that. Okay, um, but that's uh, an important uh, step. But most importantly is uh, his move. Uh, into this area, which is marked roughly here. We can't expect this to be a perfect line at that period. But this southwestern part of uh, uh, Gaul had been for a long time controlled by the Visigoths, who were the dominant group by this point in Spain, in the Iberian Peninsula. Okay, And uh, uh, it's, ju- it's, it's usually accepted as being 507. You can't see it very clearly on there. Uh, at the Battle of uh, Vouye, that he makes his first big defeat of the Visigoths and then begins to penetrate slowly in the following years down to uh, uh, their dominant area further south and so on. For a while they control what's called Septimania down here, but then that goes as well. I think perhaps under his sons that finally uh, gives, uh, gives in to the Franks. And so on, and this is uh, this is a very important battle, and we'll have a look at the uh, the documents and the accounts of that later on because it marks uh, an important step there, uh, and it has a religious. It almost is presented like a crusade or something again in Gregory of Tours, and how we, because the Visigoths were Arians, and how we interpret that, of course, is another matter. Now, what happens is that Clovis. had, uh, by his um, Christian wife, uh, he had other sons by, uh, at least one other son, probably more by other women, but by his Christian wife, uh, Clotilde, he had four legitimate sons uh, who all, in this case, survive him. He dies 511, and um, he has the strategy of dividing his kingdom up between his four sons. So rather than saying, we're going to give it to the oldest son, and then maybe there might be some fighting because the other guys feel annoyed or whatever, he decides rather to divide up the kingdom between his sons. Okay? And uh, this starts a pattern that we see uh, at a number of stages in Merovingian history, whereby we have a kingdom, but we actually have three or even four kings ruling in different areas. And then they kind of fight and eventually sometimes kill each other, brothers and and cousins and so on. And then periodically again, things get focused in on uh, on one son as others die, uh, one is left and then he, in this case, he then ends up dividing it between his sons or it divides. And then for a while, uh, in the case of of Lothar, for example, we have one king uh, for a while, but then things begin to to spread out again. So um, this is a recurring theme in Merovingian history. And just to illustrate that here, we can see uh, a couple of examples. Okay, this was the situation uh, in 5, 
uh, 61, uh, the sons of, uh, of Lothar there, you can see the different areas uh, marked in with this little region down here still connected to the Visigoths. And then if we superimpose, it's interesting, I've tried these pictures are more or less the same, uh, we superimpose that on, you can see some regions seem to have an identity, they recur as a little area that a king gets and other ones are more flexible so there's a lot of chopping the cake sometimes is chopped in similar ways and other times a little bit different over times as they as they argue and expand and things like that um, but this is a recurring problem it's either a problem because it leads to division or else it's a solution to the danger of of people one guy getting the stuff and the other guys uh, trying to undermine or fight him whatever it might be um, and as I said, the, uh, the Merovingians carry on for uh, a good while, um, but by the 8th century, uh, whether it's because of their sort of political situation, whether it's because of this habit of dividing up the empire and so on, we do find uh, the kingdom, we do find that uh, the king becomes a less, less powerful figure. And by the time uh, that the Carolingians come and take over, they haven't got really much resistance. Uh, everyone's pretty much happy to have a new bunch of people taking over uh, and setting themselves up and so on. So uh, we start a very big and then the, kind of the history of the Merovingians kind of peters out a little bit. Okay, that's a very quick uh, summary of uh, the Merovingians with uh, a main focus on um, Clovis. Let's now... For the rest of the class, we've got about half an hour left. Let's dig out our texts. Um, I've said a bit about Clovis, and we've heard uh, during the last hour information about Theodoric and so on. So let's discuss these two texts, one after the other, and then we might make some comparisons at the end to see what we might say about the two different kinds of text and also about the two different uh, kinds of individual that are presented there. So, okay, chronologically, let's begin with Theodoric then, and we heard uh, all about Theodoric from Ravel in the previous hour. Okay, before we actually get into the text, before an historian uh, starts reading and making any kind of interpretation, we have to step back first and we have to think, okay, what do we know about this text? Where did it come from? Why is it written? A whole host of kind of questions that we must very explicitly or implicitly ask ourselves before we try and interpret this and extract information out uh, and so on. So what do we know about uh, these? It's called here on this website. We've printed it from Letters of Theodoric. Tell us about these Letters of Theodoric before we actually look at the content of them. What are they? What are these letters? <coughs> who wrote them? Cassiodorus. Cassiodorus, who was? Roman dissenter of the time. Right, he was the secretary of Theodoric. He was closely connected to Theodoric's court. Uh, he was a great intellectual. He wrote some uh, <coughs> philosophical work and uh, obviously an intellectual as well as a, a, an important aristocratic kind of figure, I suppose, as well. Um, so it kind of fits into our traditional image of uh, a, an educated uh, political Roman in that kind of a sense. So here he is preparing these letters as the secretary, which means to a large extent he writes the words and uh, then Theodoric kind of will say, yes, that seems fine, or that's what I wanted you to say. And we do that at the library all the time. These blue letters, these blue memos come in Turkish, which I then sign. Uh, it's something we've discussed, or even things I haven't even discussed necessarily, but okay, this is what we need to do, so I sign it and things. It looks like it's from me, but uh, I mean, definitely I didn't write the words because my Turkish isn't that good and so on. But you could say in many cases, at least it's what I would like to say or what I've agreed that the library will be saying or something like that about a particular issue. So firstly, we've got a certain remove. So we've got kind of letters, Cassiodorus, Theodoric. So we're at a certain remove already. Okay. So if we're trying to get at this man, we're going to him via this guy, in a sense, which may, in some cases, be straightforward. In some cases, we may have to do that. And then this bit might be questionable, might be something we should think about. 
any letters for historian uh, are interesting documents. Okay. Now, a letter is what? Think of it structurally. What is a letter trying to do? How is a letter put forward? If we approach a letter, what is a letter doing at the time it's written? What do we know about letters that we often don't know about other sources? I haven't phrased the question. Difficult to phrase a question without sometimes giving the, making the answer very obvious. But um, Usually, the letters uh, give orders or requests uh, and they are primary for us. Yes, or at least the institution. It's the institution that he represents or whatever that written on his behalf. You're still getting back to something. It, it's clearly a primary source because we've got a letter, we've got the words that that man or that institution put together. For the Middle Ages, we often don't have that. We have, in a sense, secondary reporting. We have someone else saying this is what they did. For example, in the Clovis material, Gregory Tours gives all these little speeches, which will be in quotes in our translation. Now, how the hell, a hundred years later, does Gregory of Tours know exactly what people said in Germanic and he's translated it into to Latin or something? Of course not. He's made those words up. He's created those little narrative, those little dialogues, whatever. He thinks they're expressing probably what people said or what he wants them to say. But we're at a great... This remove is less, okay? It's still a certain remove but uh, for these particular letters. But a letter in theory, we've got the name of the author somewhere, Okay, at the beginning or at the end. And usually we also know to whom the letter was written. Okay, so we've got sort of author to audience or something. And knowing both of these or having some idea of both of these is very important for our interpretation of a document. Because knowing who wrote it obviously is very, very important because then we need to know his or her attitude, his or her background, possible bias and things like that. But also to whom you are writing is equally important because you say different things to different people. Okay? Just as we were saying before about the persons, uh, David Thornton as the three persons of David Thornton or something. Uh, when I write a letter to uh, send an email to my father or whatever, a very different kind of email to the one that I would send to the rector of the university and so on. Okay? So knowing whom it's written to will tell us what the kind of things we might expect and what kind of things we're not expecting okay, to be said. And what you don't say is often very important as well. Many historical sources we have to guess. We don't know who the author is. Oh, he was a member of the church and he probably lived in England. And that's about as far as we can go. And he was probably writing for educated audience or something like that. But we can't get much clearer than that. In a letter, we usually have one or even two names that tell us very clearly who the people are. So it's quite a, an advantage in a sense. But letters, particularly historical ones, uh, are rather formal documents. And so uh, their relationship is a formal one. So what they're saying is more like me writing to the rector. We don't have many me writing to my father kind of letters surviving from the late Roman or Middle Ages. In the later Middle Ages, we do have quite a collection of letters that are written by sons to fathers and things like that. But from the earlier period, we've primarily got formal letters between people in authority. So again, what they say there uh, is going to be rather different. Yep. Well, I don't know the exact transmission of these letters. We will not, it's very rare for something from uh, the late uh, uh, 5th and early 6th centuries to have the original pieces of, of parchment or uh, papyrus or whatever it was. We have copies of copies of copies. And we often have lots of different copies. And then by looking at all the different copies from 400 years, 1,000 years later, we try and reconstruct. So I don't know the manuscript history and transmission of these letters, of, of where they survive and in what context and so on. That's 
something which I find very interesting in general, but it doesn't make for great kind of classes to be trying to reconstruct manuscript histories and so on. But uh, this may not be complete. It may come from various places. There may be a single manuscript which just happens to survive that was based on one that somehow got out of Ostrogothic Italy before uh, the Byzantines came in or something like that. I mean, I don't know the, the exact context of, of, of the survival and so on. But, you know, there are relatively small number compared to what things were done at the time. So we're lucky to have these in a sense. But a good question. Uh, okay, a few general points to start us off. Let's look at the letters now. Then let's go into these uh, letters. Um, what kind of subjects, what are the things which Theodoric and or Cassiodorus thinks are necessary to write about? Why are they writing these letters? What are the subjects of these letters? Some general points here. What are the issues covered in these letters? Taxation. Taxation comes up a couple of times, the issues of taxation and so on. What else? The city of Rome. The city of Rome. Now, of course, they're based in Ravenna, aren't they, at this point? So Rome is more of a... Sorry, I thought it was a bird, wasn't it? Um, Rome is more a kind of symbol of, uh, of past greatness and things like that. But they're obviously concerned with Rome. They're giving importance to Rome, to use the, the Turkish kind of English phrase or whatever. But it, it comes up more than once, the idea of, of Rome, OK? Taxation, anything else? Praising the gods. Praising the gods. Where was that? What, is that a subject of the letter or something? Well, Right, well, that's an interesting one there. We'll come to that in more specifically, this one about the... Uh, oh, the Goths. I thought you said the gods. I was getting a bit confused. I mean, Christian context. I had enough Christianity problems before with Aryans. The Goths. And so, yeah, okay. Something to do with the Goths and organising uh, this kingdom according to uh, the people there and so on. Okay. Now, this is a very small selection. Um, but... Uh, yes, okay, uh, toleration of, uh, of, of Jewish people there or something. Um, what else then, generally? War, his opinion on war, like, uh, he is, seems like he is not fond of war and his, he attempts from, uh, to the sword barrier, he says uh, glory of battles war is not so necessary. Right. Uh, yes, that's true. Okay, um, we're interested in maintaining morality as as we can possibly be in war. Okay, this is focusing on the concept of law here, the importance of law, the law of the Romans, as he specifically calls it in that sense. Or whatever. I mean, most of these letters, if we're trying to find what can, a single word or a couple of words that would encompass, cover all of these letters, balancing, balancing what? maybe what aspect of their life is it language or culture or what is it what what is he trying to balance in these I mean I'm trying to balance ideals. now but ideals yes there's a lot of idealism here in a sense um, hmm? right we'll come back to that issue in a minute uh, what I wanted was it's kind of government in a sense, that's kind of obvious one. You might, uh, um, but um, these are his way of communicating his government, one of the ways in which they're trying to communicate his government, his administration to various parts of uh, his pseudo-empire, his kingdom, or whatever you want to call it, in a sense. So they're dealing with the city of Rome, uh, they're dealing with the issue of taxation and so on, and the relations between the Romans and the Goths, which obviously is the population of them, and then there's the issue of the religion that comes up and things like that. So balancing... Uh, uh, the popular decisions for the state, or whatever you might say, something like that. So these are these are government things. They are him not as a private individual, uh, um, but as a, as as king, uh, trying to make decisions for his his state and things like that. Okay. Now, okay, to quickly go to what I think we can 
Fatty's point before, um, often he's making decisions here. He says, this is the law, this is what you must do, this is the way it must go. Now, if someone is saying that, what does that mean? If someone is saying, you must do this, then what is the implication? Why does he need to say, everyone should pay fair taxes? Because everyone's not. So sometimes very explicitly, but sometimes again, it's suggested that we can see that things are failing, that the government isn't uh, working. So he's trying to correct that. So can you give me some examples of how we can see the kind of negative side of the society in these, in these letters? What it can tell us is the problem, and he's giving the solution to that. When he tells, when he tells when he says, like, uh, have a man go down and watch the dogs to make sure that they're not taking out um, food stuff from the empire, that, that so yes, yeah, some greedy merchants are obviously shipping loads of stuff out, not leaving enough behind, because then they can make a profit and sell it, whereas that stuff should start off at least to feed the population here, and the surplus, the word they use, the extra, will be sent out. So the implication is there's not just one guy doing that, but there's lots of, uh, of merchants or whatever it is uh, who are doing that. Others? Uh, if I remember right, uh, you wrote something about the uh, Senate's tax paying There was a very, very common, it comes up in many documents, we don't have that many documents from this period, but it's a very common <coughs> claim that one of the problems with the late Roman Empire was to do with taxation, where the government wanted money and it felt that it needed more money, it was imposing taxes. It, posed, it put the taxes on the rich people, on the upper parts of society, and all they did was extract that money from below them and the people below them extracted it, so the burden was then pushed down to the kind of lower parts of society. And that was a very common complaint that this is some kind of issue here. So it comes up in this letter in a more practical issue as well. Taxation should be fairer and should start at the top and so on. And it's a common theme all the way to French Revolution and later, of course, these, these issues. Um, what does the word embezzlement mean in the first document? To embezzle means what? Do we know? Usually it's money that's being taken. I mean, if I get, I mean, Old Jan obviously is a very uh, honest young man, I'm sure. I'm not just picking him because he's the nearest one to me. But if I gave him some money and said, OK, look, you, you're, I'm in the boss. You use this money and go and sort things out over there. The guys at the back, the desk is broken. They need better pencils or something. You go and help them. That's your job. He says, OK, Hot Jam, I'll go and do that. He goes off and he uses some of the money to fix the pencils and the chairs, but he also pockets a little bit of it on the way. He comes back and says, oh, done it, here's a little bit, oh, thank you very much, a little bit spare. You spent all that? Oh, yeah, very expensive pencils, all right, okay. He's embezzled the money, okay. And again, this is a common uh, human uh, vice or, or failing, and obviously in a system where you don't have strong authority and ways of following up orders and so on in, in a, in a, in a, in a pre-modern society without the kind of organization or even in a modern society, it's clear that the was a lot of, of corruption and embezzlement of one sort or another going on. So he wants to make sure that the money that's given for particular purposes, and this one is to do with Rome, I think, again, isn't it, is used for that purpose. It's not just siphoned off into individuals' bank accounts or wherever it might be, and so on. Um, what about uh, the document about the Goths? Uh, there's one about the laws and there's the previous one. Uh, as well, which uh, Elif mentioned there when I thought she said gods, but it was goths. Uh, Theodoric to uh, Colossius, and then Theodoric to Unigis. Unigis looks fairly kind of Germanic as a name, whereas the previous one clearly is a Roman uh, Latin name. What, what do we get from those two documents? Because here we have the issue we've been talking about a lot, Romans and Germanic peoples, and we've got them together in one document. Uh, as far as I read, uh, Roman elites were the civilians and Goths uh, are controlled. 
contracted to be the guards of those Romans in Italy. So there is something they cannot have settlement, if I'm sure, of course. And then, but they uh, they started to settle down and population mixed, and they also started not to pay the taxes. And now, in this case, there is uh, well, Theodoric himself is Gothic, but he leads to Roman population and got some minority, but maybe somehow he tries to balance them in the second and the last letter. I think maybe the gods wants to rival against, uh, rebel against Romans and he tries to calm, calm them down. Yes, there's definitely an idea of balancing, as you mentioned before, and compromising the two sides of his society that he's got. One thing that interested me when I first read this a few years ago um, was the phrase, which is kind of a bit like we were t discussing two weeks ago from, um, uh, was it one week? One week ago, Tacitus, uh, to unite, it is theirs, the role of the Goths, to unite the forethought of the Romans, so the the intellectual and uh, culture of the Romans, and the virtue of the barbarians. So that, again, that idea of the kind of noble savage, the purity of the Germanic people, that's a theme, a topos, which we can trace back hundreds of years now, back to Tastus as well. And these guys, whether it's Theodoric himself or the educated Cassiodorus, is, is picking up on that idea as well. That this, uh, We get a perfect society. We bring the purity of one people with the intellectual and cultural achievement of the other, put them together and we have Ostrogothic society in a sense. We have the population and we have the guys on top who can make it kind of work and things like that. So he's dealing with organizing society but he's also got this strange society where you've got a kind of military and political minority which is the Goths with some other people, uh, some other Goths mixed in, but the majority of the population are the Roman traditional people uh, who are needing to be kind of placated because they're not necessarily happy with being ruled by Goths. So he's, again, this issue of, of balancing. What do you think about Theodoric? Last question. From the letters we've got here, it's only you know, a couple of pages. Would you have liked to meet him, do you think? Does he seem like a reasonable guy? I think he wouldn't have time. Right. He seems like a rather busy guy. Okay, yeah. Um, but surely, of an evening, he would have sat down with a, uh, a large flagon of Gothic ale or something, and we could have knocked on his door. And... Right, yeah, yeah. He would have... Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, we... Um, he may... Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, it's kind of a silly question, obviously, but just, um, again, it's this issue of how far we can reach him and how far it's... Theodoric the King is kind of being represented here and so on. We were talking before in Ravel's presentation about the issues of uh, religious tolerance and things like that. Again, that must be something which at least was a practical issue but must be partly personal as well. So there are some personality issues which might come through. Alp? Right, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, the follow up from that. Uh, you can yeah, write a letter I mean, and say, do this. Get this fixed, or else it doesn't, doesn't exist. Right. Uh, well, yes, we need to. I mean, other sources might uh, uh, or might not tell us that. Uh, laws, and these are kind of little bits of law almost of decisions, uh, often are just have that form. And we don't have some kind of a, a, we don't have a police system. We don't necessarily have some explicit statement which just come, says, I'll come and deal with you and so on. But uh, it's part of the picture. But you're right, this is a, a reflection of kind of medieval government working. But how far we can then see whether it works or not is another matter, of course. I said, if there's a problem, then he's addressing the problem. So we have to say the problem exists. Here's his solution. And you're saying we don't know if the solution was actually put into effect or not. Uh, now, it, it's a, a moot question in the end, because by the time he dies, everything kind of begins to break down. But uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's a reasonable point as well. Uh, OK, 10 minutes, slightly less than 10 minutes. We've done too much on Theodoric. Clovis. OK, now. A uh, different situation here. Um, what do we know about his... Uh, tell me about his conversion to Christianity. He married to a Catholic wife. 
Yes. He's married to uh, uh, Clotilde, who was Christian, and, uh, and she was persistent, patient, however you want to look at it, uh, in her attempts to, um, to convert him, quite naturally. Um, what happens first? First thing, they have a son, she baptizes him, and the, the son dies, okay? So that obviously was uh, 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 unfortunate for Clotilde. That's not going to help her case. Uh, the second time almost happens again, um, but then she prays and so on, and then uh, he, the son survives. So um, uh, that's a kind of one step. Now what else happens? What's the, the big issue uh, in terms of um, uh, the conversion here and so on? which we talked about before. How does he finally come round to becoming Christian? Right, okay. Tell me a bit more about that then, from this account. Uh, he was about to uh, fail, uh, and he promised to be Christian and prayed uh, in order to win the battle. And then he won the battle, so he became Christian, he baptized. And he right, and that's, as I said, kind of got parallels with the conversion of Constantine, as is the sort of basic uh, description of that as well. And this is meant to be connected to um, his victory of the Alamans 460, uh, sort of 96 to, to 7. Now, uh, it's presented here that Clovis becomes... Catholic. He converts from being a pagan, Germanic pagan, to becoming a Catholic at this point. There is another document written by uh, a bishop, <laughs> Avitus, which has been interpreted, so I'm not saying it's the correct interpretation, but which has been interpreted by some historians to suggest the picture, the reality, was more complicated. Um, he talked about a heresy, and I think they've added Arian here, but the followers of the Arian Hera, uh, error, have in vain by a cloud of contradictory and untrue opinions sought to conceal from your extreme subtlety, haha, ha, your, your cleverness, the glory of the Christian name, uh, and so on. Okay? And there is a reference somewhere in here to, yes, on page three is the way I printed it out, near the top, one of his sisters who had fallen into the error of the Arians. So some historians have suggested that like Theodoric, Clovis originally was actually an Arian Christian and that possibly on this occasion uh, he gets persuaded by whatever means his wife or in this case victory in battle to adopt the Christian interpretation, uh, the Catholic interpretation of Christianity. But Gregory of Tours didn't like Arian uh, Christianity. He doesn't like that at all. So he's setting up Clovis as the big hero, the guy who does the conquests, the ones who establishes the true uh, faith amongst the people. So it would perhaps spoil his picture if you have pagan, then Arian, and then finally Catholic. The bit in the middle, the Arian bit, kind of compromises uh, the uh, simpler and clearer picture he wants. So it's been suggested that he deliberately smooths over that and presents what happens here as a conversion from paganism to Catholicism. Okay. Now I don't know whether, I, we can't prove that, it's, I mean, we don't have firm evidence, it's, an, it's based on interpreting documents and so on, but it's a, it's a possibility. So if that's the case, if that were the case, which it may or may not be, then we have to be very careful about what things we, we how we interpret uh, the uh, the accounts of um, uh, of uh, of his behaviour and things like that. Um, okay. Um, what about his relationship to other uh, barbarian or, or Germanic uh, rulers? What can we say about his? diplomacy, his international relations, or whatever, however you want to describe it, at that time. Uh, what does he do? How does he behave towards other Germanic kings in Gaul 
uh, in the way that uh, Gregory presents it. Is he nice to these people or is he not so nice? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, that's different. I mean, of other, there are other people who were kings uh, or claim to be king. Right at the bottom of page three, uh, two minutes to go, okay. Uh, Cloderick, uh, the son of Sigibert the Lame, who I think was a different kind of Frank. He wasn't a Salian Frank like these people. He was a Ripuarian Frank, another, another tribe, another group of Franks and so on. Uh, Clovis obviously doing all sorts of naughty things there to get his best of them. And what about on the last page, Ragnarkar, who was king at Cambrai. So some kind of a warrior chief based in Cambrai. Okay. What, what happens here? What does Clovis do with this guy? And this is one of a number. They haven't given all the examples here of what he gets up to against other noblemen and so on. Takes Sorry? Takes everything that belonged to him. Uh, he, he basically uh, uh, does the dirty on him by one way or another. And there are other examples of this kind of thing. Okay? And the ironic thing is the quotation right at the end right at the end of that paragraph. Woe to me, oh what a shame, he says. Woe to me, who I, who have remained as a stranger among foreigners, okay, in this strange land or whatever, and have none of my kinsmen, none of my relatives, to give me aid if adversity comes. What Gregory had been showing for a while is that Clovis had been going around killing most of his distant relatives who might threaten his power. So whether he's being sad that he doesn't have the relatives or whether he's just waiting for someone to say, oh, actually, Clovis, I'm here, and then whoosh, he'll get him as well. I don't know. But um, uh, Clovis presents rather explicitly uh, a, a very uh, real politique kind of a Clovis who uh, Gregory presents very clearly as someone who's very practical. He's using military power and political pressure to expand his kingdom and so on. That's what he does. Okay, I did want us to sit down for the last five minutes and chat about these two guys, but as usual, uh, we've run out of time because we've had so much fun. So let me, uh, before you escape, I still have you for at least 30 seconds, pass out the um, reading material for next week. online or with your mobile device or something like that, whatever you all do these days. Uh, the two texts which I connected via Moodle, uh, the letters sent by or rather on behalf of King Theodoric uh, to various individuals. They tell us a little bit about his administration as a uh, king in Italy. And then the uh, various uh, uh, references and discussions of the Frankish king Clovis by Gregory of Tours which gives, in my view, a very interesting picture of both Clovis and a little bit about what Gregory is doing. And um, so if you haven't uh, looked at those, we will be discussing those, I think, for a large part of the second hour. So you better uh, have a quick read of your friend's copy or something during the break uh, if you have time. So a number of themes, then, that I think we might pick up on and so on. Some things that we discussed more generally on... Uh, Tuesday in class. Um, Romanitas, Romanness. How do these individuals, um, Theodoric, Clovis, or Gregory, and Cassiodorus, the uh, secretary of uh, Theodoric, how do they kind of present Romanness? And during which time we see the Ostrogothic peoples dominating a large part of what is now Italy, okay, and into what is in fact sort of Provence uh, in southeastern France. 
uh, we see a number of people coming into what is now Spain and Portugal, but most in the long term, most significantly, the Visigoths arrive. Uh, we see lots of people making their way into what is now France, but ultimately it is the Franks who take over there. And at a later stage, we see these Longobards, the Lombards, coming in and exploiting the kind of decline of the Ostrogothic kingdom, partly under the influence of uh, what the Byzantines are doing, and establishing themselves in there. Um, our presenter for today is uh, Theodoric, I mean Ravel, uh, who will come up in a minute and tell us all about the Ostrogoths, because kind of chronologically they're perhaps uh, the most important. But I thought we'd just kind of mention, highlight at the start a few kind of themes which I'm hoping will come up more than once and that I want us to look at in the discussions that we will have. And with reference to that, I hope therefore that you have all either printed or, to save the Amazon rainforests, rent how do these people perceive themselves in connection to uh, Rome. And again, it's one of these things I've been banging on about uh, more than once, that we don't want to see a kind of sudden break somewhere in the 5th century. We say, okay, end of Rome, that's the end of everything Roman. Now we're all kind of medieval and wearing kind of simple clothes and talking bad Latin and whatever it is. Okay, uh, there was a transitional period, and can we even talk about a kind of change? And certainly, how did the people see it at the time. Okay, they may be right or wrong, but it's important to see, uh, understand how they perceived things there. Part of that, in a way, because we shouldn't exclude Christianity from Romanitas, because by the end of the Roman Empire, it was an integral part of it, and we'll discuss that in a bit more detail in a few weeks. But what's the importance, what's the role, religious, but also political and cultural role, of Christianity? In all of this, okay, where do they where do they fit in, uh, in a sense? And lastly, we've called this co topic Rome's heirs, the barbarian kingdoms. We talked a lot about the barbarian side of the equation uh, on Tuesday, what that means and so on, or doesn't mean, or whatever. For uh, the people in charge, the small minority, the guy at the top and his kind of band of followers who keep things going uh, and so on, okay, the kings and their entourage, what's going on? Okay, we don't have an emperor anymore, uh, in a sense, though, as we said, there may be some aspirations in one way or another. Um, and in the Latin texts, we get the word rex being used. These people are called king. Now, the question is, do we see, oh, well, they're just Germanic kind of uh, people and they're Germanic kings or whatever, but this is a Latin word being applied to people who are now living in what had been the Roman Empire, still might be in a sense. Uh, so we can't say that they're necessarily coming in and bringing in their Germanic style of rule. Something new is happening here. It's not an emperor, it's not a Roman emperor, but it's not just some kind of Germanic warlord. It's something that perhaps mixes the two together. As I mentioned the other day, for example, many of these kings issued laws, codes connected to their names. Okay, they're trying to rule more in a Roman way, in accordance with Roman rule and so on. Uh, the laws themselves might be old Germanic customs, but they're writing them down and they're communicating them to their people, like a Roman emperor might have done. So again, what kind of people were they in charge? What's going on here? And I think everything is kind of mixed up. Okay, we can't. So I did do a little study a couple of years ago um, on, uh, I correlated uh, final grades for one of my courses, undergraduate course, with plagiarism percentages according to Turnitin, which obviously is not 100% accurate, but it's a measurement of some sort, with attendance rates, because in that course I take every hour I checked if people were there. And uh, surprisingly enough, we did find a very clear correlation between sort of final grade and the people who were coming and the levels of copying or whatever it was they were doing uh, and so on. So attendance is not an only marker, but it's one marker of, uh, of performance and, and things like that. I don't know if, if you're not here, you can't perform. But uh, um, anyway, um, right, today 
we're going to look in a little bit more detail at uh, Western Europe t excluding the British Isles uh, during the 5th and 6th centuries primarily.